Hello, everyone. I'm Thomas Sir. I'm the CEO of Kinexum. Welcome to our webinar on digital therapeutics. This is jointly organized by Kinexum, a regulatory and clinical consulting firm, Hogan Lovells, an international law firm with a large food and drug law practice, and Lumanity, a global life science consulting firm dedicated to accelerating and optimizing access to medical advances. We have a terrific panel ready to cover a number of topics. I'll just remind you to enter any questions in the chat column, and the panel will try to get around to them in the last segment of the webinar. Just to warm up the chat function, those of you who are willing, please say hi in the chat and uh, indicate where you're logging in from. All registrants will receive the link to a recording of this webcast within a couple of business days and a transcript will follow. I'm now going to turn the mic over to Connexum founder and executive chairman, Dr. Alexander Fleming, who's our moderator, Sam. Well, thanks, Thomas. What a great panel discussion we've got today. And I'm delighted that we have one of the best moderators in the life science universe, Ed Saltzman, who's a a uh, strategic advisor at Lumanity, that he is leading the panel. No one better to do that. Ed coined the term proof of relevance to describe indisputable demonstration of clinical and economic value in drug development. And boy, that's what he does, is to advance value of products. Undisputable relevance is the apt term for our subject today. So let's find out what, why, and how. Without further ado, Ed, take it away. Thank you, Zan, and no pressure whatsoever as being called the best moderator in the <laughs> universe. Right. I, um, I, hope, uh, I hope not to live up to that. Um, <laughs> what, um, and, and I will say that, that Zan Fleming has perhaps the best powers of persuasion in the universe um, for, for persuading me to take on this role um, I will say that when Zan first reached out, um, he asked me about digital, would I moderate this panel um, with Jody and some panelists to be put together on the subject of digital therapeutics. I sort of said, what is a digital therapeutic? Um, just to put that in context for you, um, you know, I've spent three and a half decades um, working um, really on the, on the edge of biotech strategy, particularly for early stage science-driven companies, really focusing on therapeutics. That's my context. Um, but I do presently um, work for and advise a, a large firm that is leveraging a number of platforms, particularly one that's developing a really, and the, developing a really differentiated real world evidence platform. And so I'm quite interested in the intersection of platforms that are looking at real world evidence and sort of the evolution of what I've now learned or what I think I've learned as a digital therapeutic. Um, fascinating to me, great timing, I think. Um, you know, I spend my time mirrored in biotech markets and capital markets, which um, most of you probably know are, are not very, um, uh, encouraging right now. So if nothing else, then a distraction, a really interesting distraction from the sort of the funk of the conditions in the biotech markets, it's delightful to, um, you know, to be exposed to um, this new field and delightful opportunity to learn so much from the panelists that we have today. And I'll try to live up to, to the role to keep the discussion flowing and, and get everybody involved. Um, questions will come in. Um, Thomas has taken on the, the and already see that there are 15 comments in the chat. Um, so hopefully we'll have a, a pretty live discussion. Um, Thomas uh, took on the role of, uh, we'll, we'll take on the role of monitoring the questions. Um, if you see questions that come in, I told Thomas that appear to be relevant to a point we've just made, just submit them um, and Thomas and we'll take that question, but we'll have plenty of time at the end for, for Q&A. My goal is to leave maybe 30 minutes or more at the end for, for Q&A. Um, so with that, I'm just gonna turn to the panelists. I'm gonna ask them to just very briefly self-introduce and then while you self-introduce or perhaps during your self-introduction, just give us a, a sense of where you come from in this digital therapeutics discussion. Don't worry about defining it. We'll get to that in a minute, but tell me where you where you come from. Okay, so I'll start in, in no particular order. Well, let's start with Jody because Jody, we, we started there. Okay. Hi, thank you. Um, so good morning. I'm Jody Scott. I'm a partner with Hogan Lovells 
uh, medical device practice. I'm actually sitting in Denver, um, not with the rest of my people all in DC. Um, I'm a FDA medical device lawyer, which means I help companies with anything FDA related um, and specifically only in the medical device space. And so in the past probably 10, 12 years, we've been doing a lot more digital health work. Uh, I co-lead our firm's Digital Health Working Group, which is a cross-functional group of any, any lawyer that touches anything related to digital health, which means we have gotten involved in sort of um, everything from kind of birth to death of these products. So we do a ton of work in the submission space. So we've actually helped bring a number of these products to market, um, get a, a good number of them actually through FDA. And then of course, once you get the product to market, you, you need to commercialize. And so there's a lot of things you need to think about um, when commercializing any product, but in particular digital therapeutics, because uh, the, the healthcare system and the distribution networks um, and the reimbursement um, scheme is not really set up for these products. And so it has taken a lot of creative thinking on top of how the system works to figure out how do you do this stuff and how do you help companies um, commercialized products in a way that meets their FDA obligations and all their legal obligations and also their obligations to their investors and patients. Let's never forget the patients. Um, so that's a little bit about me, Ed. Thanks, thank you. Sherry. Um, why don't I let my panelists go in what order they see themselves. So I've got, I've actually got a, a big screen here with a bunch of people on it. So I'm not even sure now who's, who's actually on the panelists, but, but Eddie, why don't you, why don't you go next? Sure, happy to. Um, thanks, everyone. Glad to be here. Uh, my name is Eddie Martucci. I'm the co-founder and CEO of Achille. Um, Achille is a public company listed on the NASDAQ, one of the early um, digital therapeutic companies that really specializes in uh, making true medical treatments out of digital. Um, and what I mean by that is products that are studied and validated in clinical trials, um, brought through full FDA regulatory review, um, and then today prescribed by doctors and um, starting to be covered by insurance, which is exciting. Um, so uh, our lead product is called Endeavor RX, um, which is a treatment for children with ADHD. Um, it is the first product in the world and still the only product in the world that has regulatory authorization uh, as a prescription that is delivered through a video game. So this treatment is truly uh, a new type of medicine in that it's experienced like a video game based on groundbreaking research out of UCSF. Um, it's The platform is meant to target cognitive dysfunction across a range of diseases. So we're working in ADHD. Um, we have studies ongoing in a wide range of ADHD ages, um, and we have clinical data in depression, um, autoimmune disorders like MS and lupus and beyond. So um, the way I view this is we we are one of the early, you said, where did we come from? Uh, we are one of the early companies in the field. Um, I've been kind of growing this company and this field. Um, I also sit on the board of the Digital Therapeutic Alliance, which is the industry organization for uh, products in this industry and companies in this industry. Um, so I get to see how this field is evolving, the ups, the downs, the positives, the negatives. Um, and I'm really excited about uh, some, of the, some of the green shoots I'm seeing in this industry today. So happy to be here. Great. Um, uh, Nadav, you want to go next? Sure. Um, first of all, thank you all for having this great event and uh, looking forward to the discussion. My name is Nadav Shimoni. I'm uh, leading the Digital Health Fund within Arkin. Arkin uh, is a $2 billion uh, healthcare and life science investment group located in Israel. I'm personally located in the US, in uh, the great state of New Jersey. Um, and Arkin is based on essentially the second largest pharmaceutical company that ever come, came out from, of Israel um, and sold it about two decades ago. So we live and breathe pharma for more than half a century in the organization, I would say. So for us as digital health investor, digital therapeutics uh, is really uh, an area of interest. We've been uh, targeting that area and, uh, and kind of like trying to examine what could be uh, relevant for us within this space for quite some time now. Um, shared some thoughts in our in our blog uh, for our participants who are uh, interested in, in having more color about our thoughts in the field, but I'm sure we'll cover at least some of this in today's discussion. Uh, I'm also, uh, in a sentence about myself, I'm a physician by training, so in a way coming to that space with some, uh, I would say, clinical perspective, you know, think about how physicians are, are kind of like 
perceiving that uh, advantage, advantage and, and how they will, uh, how can we make physicians more receptive to digital therapeutics is a question we're having in mind uh, constantly. Um, very much looking forward uh, for today's discussion and we'll leave, uh, we'll leave time for further comments later on. Thank you, Ed, and thank you all. Great. And Wojtek is one of my uh, colleagues at Humanity who I've had the pleasure to just recently, not too long ago, meet. Um, showing that we're growing fast and we're, we're a larger and larger organization. But, but Wojtek, you wanna, wanna say a few things? Sure. So my name is Wojtek Sudo. I've been in life sciences a little over 15 years on the commercialization side, always in the very uh, innovative spaces where things are different, anything from um, CNS through hereditary cancer diagnostics, and then spent a little bit, a couple of years in software, which led me to Cyan Health at the time, now part of Lumenity, as we were you know, expanding our presence in digital therapeutics, uh, fast growing, that was about two years ago, but Cyan Health and the value and access uh, communication, all the strategy and communication that we developed, we've been in digital therapeutics. I think the original product was somewhere around 2010. So altogether institutional knowledge of about 13 years now in this space, which feels like ancient history. Uh, space is developing quickly. So day to day, it's super exciting. We have clients, everything that um, have products in both digital therapeutics, prescription digital therapeutics, platforms as a service, and then some software accompanying medical devices. So this is a, a fairly broad view into the market and combined with the extensive research that we do on a day-to-day basis, uh, it makes it for an exciting space to be. So I'm happy to join the discussion. Great. So um, so I think we've, we've covered everybody. Um, Somebody told me if I've left anybody out. Um, I don't think so. So let's let's get the conversation started. Um, and I sort of teased this up before. Um, I, I'm, I'm going to ask the panelists, and I, this is the one question I think I'll get everybody's perspective on. Um, in terms of you know moderating style, I, I don't love to just go down the panel one by one by one and have everybody answer the same question. But if for some reason I don't call on you and you want to jump back in, please do. Um, just jump in or, or shout out on the chat. I'll try to monitor that as well. Um, but let's start with that definition thing. Um, I, I just think it's really, really important. And as I, as I sort of set out before, um, in reading through and trying to come up to speed on this you know, fascinating topic, um, it was clear to me that there, you know, articles on digital therapeutics start talking about companies that have just raised major rounds that don't look that, like they're doing anything relating to a therapeutic as I would come to understand it, which would be the kind of thing that Eddie just described in the introduction that would be going through a, a, a sort of a drug-like you know, development path. Um, so let's talk about what is and what isn't a digital therapeutic. How big is the tent? Um, how big do, does, does the, can the tent be? And, and what fits under the umbrella of digital therapeutics? Since, since Eddie, I'm going to get to you on that because I know you. I can tell from the from the earlier discussion that you're passionate about it. But because you are, I'm going to start with um, I'll start with Jody on this one because I think you know we started talking about that early in the formation of this panel. So tell me, Jody, what is and isn't a digital therapeutic to you, and and why does it matter? So so let me start with so the. Digital Therapeutics Alliance has actually a really nice, pretty simple definition that I think sort of touches on all the points. And then I'll try and put a little bit more meat on the bones. Mm -hmm. So they define it as a medical intervention directly to patients using evidence-based clinically evaluated software to treat, manage, pre and prevent a broad spectrum of diseases and disorders. And I think you know, each of those bits is really important, but in terms of digital therapeutics, you know, they, they are evidence-based. I think there's sort of a component, at least it has been, where people just wonder whether or not these things will actually work. Mm -hmm. um, you know, but they are really science and evidence-based. They run clinical studies, they prove out their outcomes, um, and, and it's really exciting to see these things actually have an impact. Um, and let me talk a little bit about what they look like. So 
digital therapeutics, they are software based. Um, in some cases, they are standalone. The whole therapy for treating diseases and conditions is the software, and that's it. Sometimes they are coupled with sensors um, that provide information and data back into the software. Um, and sometimes they're coupled with pharmaceutical agents. Um, it really intended to um, kind of synergize with the pharmaceutical and hopefully improve effect efficacy and outcomes for patients. So it's kind of all of these things, but really when we're talking about digital therapeutics, it's the software component that the patient is using the software and actually achieving a therapeutic outcome. And, and let me just give you a little bit of idea about what there is. And I know Eddie can talk a little bit more about the Digital Therapeutics Alliance, but you know, so far FDA has approved some really cool technology and it's not all in the space where you would think it's just mental health apps, things like treating insomnia, um, the substance use disorders are probably the ones that most people are familiar with or the opioid use disorders, um, ADHD, diabetes management, there are therapeutics for irritable, irritable bowel syndrome, which I think is really cool because I, I wouldn't have conceived of that being one, but it works. Um, some for mood disorders. And so, and there are more and more of these getting through FDA as FDA gets more and more comfortable with the process. Um, and I did want to just mention, I think one of the reasons it's become so murky around what is and is not a digital therapy is because it's cool. And so a lot of people want to be able to say that they're in this category. Um, and also, you know, this is sort of one of the good things that came out of the pandemic, which is FDA had a number of policies that allowed companies to develop and release um, products for psychiatric mood dis disorders and a number of other disorders. And so there's a lot of technology that came out in that time period um, to try to help patients while we were all at home in our pajamas. And I think that that has, it's good, but I do think it's sort of made things murky around what is a digital therapeutic. So, so Eddie, what did, uh, what did Jody leave out, if anything? Um, you know, she, I thought it was a pretty comprehensive overview. I think I now understand what a digital therapeutic is, and probably I understand what it isn't. Um, yeah. I think actually that's the really, that's the real question. You know, what can we, what can we take out of this conversation? Do we take out anything that's not going through an FDA process? Um, do we take out anything that's not making a drug-like therapeutic claim? Um, how do we, how do we focus what really is a digital therapeutic? Yeah, great question. And I agree with pretty much everything Jody said. I think the point at the end was really um, critical, which is why this has become a bit confusing which is it's cool, as Jody said, um, it's, it is, has been a hot area. It's gone through bumps and ups and downs, but it's been a hot area. And frankly, it's pulled in a lot of money, right? Our company has raised a couple hundred million dollars and gone public. Another company had raised a few hundred million dollars and gone public. So as soon as people started seeing B rounds and C rounds and public rounds, um, this is what happens in the innovation ecosystem is companies and products try to pitch themselves as something. And they're probably not, and it, it does confuse for a while, but this is very normal. Um, we're seeing it in AI right now, right? Everybody, uh, every company apparently on earth does AI for something. And the truth is 90% of those companies probably don't even do AI. Um, so I think you're seeing the same thing. I think it will calm down. What's really critical, and I'll just underline um, Jody's point there is, these are products that are meant to be studied and clinically validated and themselves, this is how I always define it for people, these software products themselves drive a clinical outcome, meaning you use the product, it treats something in your body, it treats something in your condition, and it drives an outcome. Now, the easiest, ver I'll, I'll work backwards, the easiest version I think that people really understand um, is something like what we do. Uh, our product doesn't uh, use human practices or teach someone strategies to cope with their condition. It directly changes the neurological structures in the brain through exposure to what people, and in this case, children are using in Endeavor RX. We have half dozen publications showing just like a drug, very differently, but conceptually, like you'd think about a therapeutic drug, um, it's being exposed to the body. It's having a physiological effect on the body. And then there are outcomes that you get one month, two months, three months later, right? And um, and that's it. And it's approved by the FDA. And today it's being prescribed by docs. That's really, that's really um, 
easy, I think, for people to understand. It's like what I call the magic of medicine. You use a product, it actually changes something in your body and it you know, leads to an outcome. I think what, what is debatable, um, but I, I do include as digital therapeutics are things that are taking human practices um, that are uh, putting those human practices into apps, but are, um, uh, so they're digitizing them. They're a digital therapeutic as long as they're being evaluated in clinical trials and by themselves having some sort of positive outcome. So some of the products that Jody mentioned are, you know, behavioral therapies. Um, I think that's that's cool. Like behavioral therapies are great. I don't think it's what everyone sees as the future of this industry. I think people want to see really dramatic, big idea um, pieces of software that that change human physiology. But it's it can be very helpful for patients. And as long as it's studied in clinical trials, has a label that is clearly trying to you know treat or manage a condition, um, and that product has the effect, then that's that to me qualifies. But you can see how that muddies the waters a little bit because cousins to that concept are definitely not digital therapeutics. So uh, you asked me to define a little bit of like what's not. What's not, right. So let's define what's not. Um, medication management. Mm-hmm. Not a digital therapeutic, even though most medication management uh, companies now are positioning themselves as digital therapeutics. Um, monitors, right? Things that monitor a condition for someone and then give them data so that that person can try to adapt their life. Um, Monitors, even if they're super digital and cool, not digital therapeutics. Um, Disease management applications, meaning um, giving you tips and tricks and and tools to kind of cope with your condition um, and, you know, have a better quality of life just because you know a little bit more about your condition. Also not digital therapeutics. So um, I think that's where the line starts to draw. Is this software in and of itself powerful? Has it been proven in clinical studies? And does it directly drive a clinical outcome? That's easy to prove through clinical trials. Um, and I think we're going to see a lot more products coming to the world that are very clearly in the camp of what we're all excited about and talking about digital therapeutics and a whole lot of also ran products that are fine, but are definitely not. That's great. Um I think I think that's comprehensive, right? So unless any of the other panelists wants to weigh in on, you know, what is and what isn't, because I think between Jody and Eddie's comments, I think we've got a pretty good feel for what is. I just want to remind everybody in the audience to please mute because there is an echo that that comes when people are not muting on my microphone. I'm going to try to work through it. Um, Ed, Ed, maybe maybe I'll, I'll, I'll do pitch in for a second and, and hopefully be a bit provocative because I do think there is some semantics or so maybe things worth adding. I will just you know be brief and mention two things and I'm also hearing that echo so if people can uh, put themselves on, on mute. Um, I will just add two things. I think currently um, I, I fully agree with Eddie around kind of like the clinical element. Uh, I would just say I've you know tons of respect to the great work the folks at FDA are doing, but I think right now the FDA bar is a bit too low. And I think one of the things that will truly differentiate true digital therapeutics is showing the level of evidence we will anticipate, you know, from drugs um, and not just, you know, from software to some extent. And I think it would be great to double click on that uh, later in the conversation. And second of all, I think the, the the prescription element is also important. I think some of the differentiating factor is that digital therapeutics for me are like drugs, things that you know clinician will prescribe, um, and not just things you know people will download from the app store. Um, and for that reason, you know many things that I think Eddie, you know, very rightfully so mentioned, are not relevant as true software as drugs, as we try to call, you know, digital therapeutics. These, I guess, you know, my, my two cents on the question that I thought worth mentioning. So so that teased up the question, and and in Wojtek, I'm going to get you into this conversation in a minute, I promise. Um, I just, I, I just, but, I, but, I, but it was a very good segue. So what I just heard uh, Nadav, you say is that, you know, the FDA bar isn't high enough. Um, usually people in, in biotech and pharma don't make that complaint, right? I mean, you know, I've never heard of a biotech or a pharma executive saying the FDA bar isn't high enough. Zan, I doubt you ever heard it either. Um, you know, um, so we're clearly in different territory here, right? 
where, um, so, and I actually had a question, you know, teed up and Wojtek, feel free to comment on this, um, you know, if you'd like, but, but this will go out to, to everyone, anyone who wants to take it. Um, I think we've got an idea of what the current regulatory status sort of is, but we could get a little more clear on that. Um, but I guess to the to your point, do we need do we need to raise the bar? Do we need regulatory innovation? Um, and what forms is it likely to take as we get more companies raising more money and pushing more software with more claims? Um, does this path get tougher? Um, does it need to get tougher, or does the FDA just got to be a little bit um, smarter and adapt? And you know, I mean. You know, it's it's it, the the first thing I thought of when I saw what was going on with digital therapeutics. It occurred to me that when it came to things like gene therapies and cell therapies, um, you know, the agency needed to you know to move along. It needed to innovate. It needed to keep up with with the innovation and what was going on. This may be a similar kind of case. Um, so, can I get some some thoughts from the, from from the panel? And um, Eddie, you want to you want to I see you want to you want to want to jump yeah, in? Yeah, I would I would love to jump in because um, respectfully to Nadav, I I disagree. I think it's a myth. Actually, I think for the vast majority of digital health, right? Because there's a whole lot of digital health stuff out there that has been through the FDA in different ways. That might very well be true that there's a couple of different layers, but. There's actually a myth floating around that digital therapeutics, meaning the, the things that Jody and I define, don't have a high enough bar or don't even have, there's a really bad myth out there, including in payers and insurers, that digital therapeutics don't aren't even judged by efficacy, right? A lot of people have this myth that, oh, it's a medical device and therefore, you know, it's mainly judged on safety. That could not be farther from the truth. So there are about nine products right now. Um, Endeavor RX, my product is one of them that have gone through FDA approval. The vast majority of those have gone through a de novo process. And the de novo process um, forces that this has to have a reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy. It also defines efficacy as a clinically meaningful benefit to patients. And I promise you, I can give you my word, our nearly two-year review for Endeavor RX, 95% of the questions and the work and time spent was on the efficacy. We had to give five clinical trials over 600 patients. So there's, um, I understand that with the confusion of what digital health and digital therapeutics are, that it might be an issue, but these real therapeutic, these pieces of software that are actually treating disease, mm -hmm. I, I, I want to kind of yell from the mountaintops here um, that these are, these are hitting a bar that is very similar to what you see in any other category mm -hmm. of medicine requiring prospective clinical data, well-run trials. What the difference is, is the label, right? So what FDA is looking for is a reasonable assurance of safety and efficacy for the label. So sometimes if you see a digital health product and it has a weak label, that's why the data is not there. But if you look at a product that's treating attention in ADHD, for instance, or treating substance use disorder, and it's gone through a, a de novo process with the FDA, that has been put through a very rigorous threshold of efficacy. And the reason I'm so passionate, you can hear my passion coming through. The reason I'm so passionate about this is I was okay with that kind of myth circulating around for the last couple of years until I started hearing insurers use it as an excuse. Okay, so so let me um, let me pick that up as a, and Nadav, I want to give you a chance to, to come back on that in a minute, but I, I, I want to get Wojtek involved um, and I've got the perfect segue to do it. So so, you know, <clears throat> when we, we talk about the, you know, in the, in the conventional therapeutic realm, right? Um, you, you know, the payers, getting regulatory approval is like your first step, right? I mean, you know, you still got to sell the product and you still got to get it through payers. So, so Wojtek, how do, how do the payers, how are payers feeling about this, this, you know, innovation in digital therapeutics, the path, and it's the evidence that, that these programs are being approved on. Is this evidence sufficient for payers? Does it need to get better? And on the double, I'll come back to you. So I love this question. My answer is always the same, which is it depends. Mm -hmm. um, so if you, I have to answer this way. So if we're talking about digital therapeutics, we're, we're bucketing a lot of things. Right? We're throwing everything into one bucket, right? So the, the conversation gets confused. And within the uh, Jody, I think you offered the definition. Within there, it says evidence, right? Evidence-based. 
evidence can mean a lot of things. That confuses things to the next level. And then there's the payers, which do we need evidence? Do we need approval? Do we need clearance? Do we need you know, grant from uh, FDA? And the answer is always, it depends, right? Because wellness apps, I'm gonna completely separate digital therapeutics, yes or no, depending on the product and what it treats, prescription digital therapeutics, that's where I think this is where this conversation has been for the last 15 minutes about prescription digital therapeutics. Um, it's really, it depends on the payer and on the type of the payer, right? So PBM will look at it differently and we've done extensive research, right? So even geographically, depending on the concentration of people in the area, depending on how many providers are in the area for a specific disease, that level of evidence required will be much different, right? What's interesting, and this is across all payers, is that payers will look at evidence first before they look at FDA approval. And this goes to sort of cement Eddie's um, you know, statement that payers don't necessarily see software as medical devices or medical devices approval process or clearance process as rigorous, which it's not true, right? It's, it, it's, it's very rigorous, there's a lot of studies. However, if there's a product that's digital therapeutic, it, I know of products that have 16, 18 studies, really well-run clinical trials, and they never submitted for clearance or approval simply because they know they can get reimbursement from payers um, based on what the product does to the population, right? So it, it really, it, I, I think as an industry, we need to individualize these conversations and, and be very, very clear as to what, what the product does, what disease does it treat or manage, and most importantly, what type of payer is paying for this, Right? Is it a VA? Is it an IDN? Is it a PBM? A, you know, is it a regional payer? And then communicate accordingly. And, so, and I think so Vortech, you, yeah. if I go ahead, Jordan, in. go ahead. So I think you point out sort of an important distinction here is there's a lot of technology coming through FDA for, as software as a medical device. Um, and so, and, and they do, a lot of them come through 510K, but a lot of them also go through this de novo path. But the data that they have to provide, depending on what their indications, is less than what is being provided for a digital therapeutic. When you talk about a digital therapeutic, they really are essentially proving out safety and efficacy in a similar way to a, a pharmaceutical. Um, and the other thing that they do is they actually spend and do studies um, on sort of the user interface and the ability of the users to actually use the technology successfully um, to actually achieve that digital outcome which is a little bit of a different type of study than what you would ever really see in a pharmaceutical space um, because it doesn't do anybody any good to have a, a, a software application that somebody can't use, that the patients can't successfully use. And so their data burden is actually pretty high, um, but I hear you, you know, there, there's, there's a range of levels of evidence, but this small category of digital therapeutics really truly has an incredibly high level of, uh, of evidence that they're putting forward. So no, no, uh, one of the um, yeah. one of the easiest uh, roles of the moderator and most fun roles of moderator when somebody jumps in and says I completely disagree with what somebody else just said. So I want to come I want to come back to you in the spirit of having a great engaging you know back and forth and get your thoughts on what Eddie had said in response to your your comments. No, uh, first of all, I have a, you know tons of respect you know for what Akili have done and and just to emphasize, I'm not sure we are you know as the other panelists mentioned we are comparing apples to apples. I think there are you know different companies, different cl clinical trials that have been performed on a much different levels. I'll do say that there were a couple of things the FDA have done over the last couple of years that for us as an investor really uh, turned the FDA stamp to be less impressive, I would say, than you know perhaps it should have been. You know, to your point about FDA being a really high, I don't know, prevent providing a high bar. First is a, the pre-certification program and pair participated in that program from 27, 27, uh, 2017, sorry. And, and the fact that some product went through that program, whereas others didn't, I think made some difference. Second, uh, I, I do think that around mental health, there were some 
relaxation throughout COVID and the bar for products that are targeting mental health in a certain way were addressed differently than other digital therapeutic products. Um, and finally, I will say we examine a lot of the data coming from different companies. Many of these trials weren't uh, very rigorous, I would say, um, you know, without putting names, but, you know, we've done a lot of efforts examining that uh, data. And, you know, the fact that uh, surveillance progress was pretty short, the fact that there weren't really sham procedures. Um, I'm not saying for a second there aren't no kind of like rigorous trials. And I think Achille have done tremendous work there. But I do, th I do think that, you know, pairs, you know, to, Voy to Voin's point, are, are being a bit hesitant, sometimes for a good reason, because they want to have a concrete proof on the clinical efficacy and the economic efficacy as well of, of these products. So in a certain way, it, you know, it balanced the discussion to some extent, uh, but I, I felt kind of like obliged to, pro to provide that point of view uh, into the discussion. Thanks, Don. I, I think that's great. And I think it balances out. I, I mean, I think that, you know, regardless of whether, it, it, you know, I, I think the underlying takeaway that I have is that is that you actually both agree more than you disagree. Um, I think that, you know, I mean, I think that um, Eddie's firm and, and, and others are, are pursuing the path that is helping me actually understand what a digital therapeutic really can be. And, and what it could not be and what, what it, we probably shouldn't call digital therapeutics. So let me transition off that. And let me then switch around a little bit and, and, and actually move that discussion because I think what we've, we've accomplished in the first um, you know, 35 minutes or so is I think we've got a good setting of what, what really is a digital therapeutic. And I do wanna leave a lot of time for Q and A. So this time is actually going much faster than even I thought it would, which is terrific. Um, but let me let me let's talk about let's talk about business models for a little bit, all right? Um, because when we talk about digital health and digital health approaches, um, the business model implications aren't always clear, okay? Um, you know, because we now understand that digital therapeutics are software as medicine. That's the easiest sort of soundbite way to understand it. But that doesn't necessarily translate into one consistent business model, right? Um, so we know from Voitech, and we know, you know, from the discussion that came up, that we we have to we have to, or it's a large part of the industry's mission um, to get legitimization, um, have that data, and get get coverage and third party reimbursement. Um, and that's a very traditional form of business model, right? So. So what is the business model, you know, for digital therapeutics? Um, I heard a lot about we have to convince physicians. Um, you know, we probably have to convince patients. Um, you know, Eddie, in your case, in the case of Achillea, you probably have to convince parents, right? Um, so there's a lot of, 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 of sort of multitude of ways to, to business models. So, um, what do you think, um, Eddie, since you're probably, you might be testing the market relatively soon, um, or you are actually in the market right now. Um, tell me about what you think the business models are and are, are going to evolve to. Sure. Um, and, and you're right. We're in market right now. We just launched formally um, at the end of October. We have... Um, uh, now we're really excited. We have prescriptions that have come from every state in the country. We have a growing number every month. I apologize for my dog barking. We have uh, a growing number of new doctors every single month that are actually prescribing this product, you know, over 100 to 150 docs a month, like brand new docs who have never prescribed a digital treatment before. And that continues. So we are seeing uptake for sure in patients, for sure in doctors and slowly, very, very slowly. Um, with insurers. What I always tell people is, um, I think the jury is out. I'll be honest. Uh, I think the jury is out on what is the perfect business model for digital therapeutics. I don't think anyone has solved it yet. Um, I think we're seeing really good success in a more pharmaceutical style business model where you're actually getting paid for um, the product when it's rendered to patients, meaning the value is in the treatment itself. The value is in the prescription. That's how we're doing it. 
um, you know, priced uh, at parity with, with medication. And, you know, what we want is insurers to cover the burden mostly, but patients to pay a little bit, right? That's a, that's a model that tends to work in American healthcare um, for other types of medicine. And, and it keeps patients with a little skin in the game, but not too much burden. And it pushes burden to insurers. That's where I think we're going. And we are seeing that that model is starting to work, right? Um, what I think is the big question is time. So um, often these models, if you're given unlimited time, you know, in this case, five to 10 years with brand new models, then a model like this, clearly the trajectory is it would work. But I think what you're going to see in the digital therapeutic space is um, you know, most of these companies are still startups. Most of these companies are still in an environment where they don't have five to 10 years of cash. They have, you know, max two years of cash and we're in an economic recession that's going to be deep. So I think what you'll see actually, which is a good thing, I think it's a good thing, is that uh, companies will start experimenting with those models. I don't think you're going to see a single model. And my gut is the model that's going to end up winning is actually going to have some elements of a core prescription model, but maybe some elements of a consumer model um, because this is software that engages patients. Wojtek, what what's your view about um, that 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 you know the the business models out there, and you know in terms of you know the the urgency of getting third party reimbursement versus perhaps just going on a you know on a self pay basis. <clears throat> I, I personally think that you know, business one-on-one, right? The, the, the business model has to fit, basically fit the market. And there, there's no single market for prescription digital therapeutics. Even if we go to the payers, we have to look at what problem are we solving, right? So let's take, like, you know, Eddie's company, it's, it solves a very real problem, right? It solves, it's a therapy for kids. It's, it's a defined disease. It's, it's very in line what the prescription could do, but could probably do better, safer, and faster, right? And more accessible. So, you know, that's one problem. If you're solving a problem of, let's say, there's a, you, you know, there's a patient that already takes medication, but it's not working, uh, already seeing a psychotherapist, but it's not working or, or has to drive six hours, that's a much different problem, right? Now you're solving the problem of accessibility that no medication will solve. So payers will look at it differently. They'll pay for it differently. And potentially now you're going into the realm of employers, right? How does this impact my, um, my employees and what the impact is on disability? You know, do we pay the long, long-term disability claims? What does that cost us? That's a much different, different issue. So essentially, in my view, and I know this is, you know, sort of a catch-all, but you, you really have to look at each, I'm going to say this again, each digital therapeutic and say, what problem are we solving and what business model can we apply? Can we take this over the counter? And to earlier Eddie's point, 80% of digital, you know, things that claim to be digital therapeutics are simply to be sold over the counter, just like any app on Google app. And the market will kind of sort it out of, you know, is this useful or is it not useful? Great. So, um, so I'm, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna move from business models to, to sort of the the broader interest of of strategics and in the I want to involve you here, um, but I, but Jody, I'm I'm really interested in hearing your view um, as well. Um, you know, large pharma, um, we haven't we haven't mentioned large pharma here, right? Um, very much, um, you know, and, and yet, you know, every large pharma today has a position called chief digital officer. Um, in many cases, in fact, most of the top 10 pharmas, that's an executive level, executive committee level position. So pharma is clearly signaling that it has a lot of interest in digital approaches, but I'm not so sure pharma has that much interest yet, or we've seen that much interest from large pharma in digital therapeutics. Um, so. Nadav, what do you think? What do you see out there? Because, you know, we, we, we're talking about business models because clearly we'd like to build businesses. But from the investor point of view, from the venture investor point of view, what we'd like to do is we'd like to, you know, seed some exits. Um, and so what is, and I don't want to just assume that large pharma is the only strategic and the only strategic acquirer here, but um, 
Um, are they really there? Is, is large pharma really there? Uh, when you go out and you conduct diligence or you talk to large pharma companies around some of these approaches, what is the level of interest really there? Are they skeptical? Are they getting warmed up? Or are they interested? I think it's, it's a super important question. Um, and I will start from the bottom line. Uh, I think the answer is not yet. Um, you know, we've tried to do a lot of work with pharma. I think Honestly, there is a big difference from things you are reading, uh, you know, online and hearing in conferences, and the intimate conversation you can have with people and what they are saying in that in, in these conversations. I mean, again, Arkin, we've been in in the pharmaceutical industry for half a century now, um, and and investing in biotech and pharmaceutical companies for almost two decades with about a billion and a half dollars AUM. So there is a breadth of work with pharma, uh, you know, just, you know, sharing some numbers to, to provide some additional color on that. Um, I would say that first, you know, to your point, Ed, it seems like these are very senior roles, but when you look at different pharma organizations, you see the cadence of changes, you know, pharma are doing. Uh, uh, I will, I won't, mention names just to be cautious not to mention things that are not a public knowledge but you know different companies every year or two are having changes in their strategy um, and are having some different roles coming in or out maybe signaling they are still trying to figure it out um, I think pharma are struggling at this point to understand what is the real value they can gain from digital therapeutics what is the threat, to be honest, by digital therapeutics? I mean, when you consider pharma's tremendous investments in new products and the low percentage of products that actually reach you know, mark the market, would digital therapeutics be complementary to these products or would they cannibalize you know, the revenues from these products? Would it make sense to consider digital therapeutic product coming before the actual drug? Would it hinder um, the, the efforts uh, made to actually promote the actual drug? Would it be more, more uh, reasonable to look at kind of like combo treatments? Um, maybe digital therapeutics could be some sort of a joint go-to-market play, lowering adverse events. Maybe they can increase adherence for the core drugs. So I think there are a couple of very different questions. Pharma are still trying to figure it out. I'm also certain there is no one size fits all and there are very different types of products and different companies. Um, and sometimes with you know certain diseases, it will make more sense than others. So again, coming back to a question, I think the, the answer is pharma are still trying to figure it out. Um, and, and definitely, you know, there will be some exciting progress coming from pharma, but it will take more time and, and we'll just end, you know, with your, the, the second part of your question. I do think there are other strategics, which are non-pharma that are relevant to digital therapeutics. Um, you know, big tech could be relevant, pairs could be relevant to some extent, and we can, you know, elaborate on that later on, but I hope that answers the question. It does, and I want to go, Jody. Do you have any 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 thoughts you'd, you'd like to add there? You know, I think I agree with everything that I've said, but I I do want to add. You know, so I'm a medical device lawyer, so I come at this from the medical device side, but my background is actually in pharmacy. Um, and what we're seeing with pharma companies, they absolutely feel like it's a business imperative that they be in the digital health space. Um, but I don't know that they're quite ready to get into the digital therapeutic space, but they'd like to. Um, I think they're spending a lot of time on sort of different types of applications right now that increase patient compliance. Um, they are looking at some diagnostic, a lot of diagnostics that help them target their patients who are going to do be well on their drugs better. You know, if you can find the right patients who are going to be more successful, then you're going to have better outcomes overall. Maybe not as many patients treated, but better outcomes in the ones that do get treated. So that's a very interesting area for them. Um, in terms of the prescription digital therapeutic space, I think where they are exploring is where you can add, you have an existing drug or therapy, and you can add a digital therapeutic to amplify the effect of the drug. And I'm not talking about, you know, just getting patient compliance, because we all know if you can just get the patients to take the drugs that they've got, 
many of them will do better. But I'm talking about actually a therapeutic effect that is synergistic to the drug yeah. um, and actually gets a, a greater outcome. You know, that is the type of thing that they are figuring out. How do you transition from being a drug company to a device company? Because from a distance, we kind of look the same. But if you start to think about logistically, how do you implement and execute on a device strategy from a drug perspective, there's a lot of differences. And so I think strategically, that's why these pharma companies have put these positions and departments in their companies and put them at a high level because it requires somebody, people with device experience, but also strategic thinkers to think about, you know, the world right now is greenfield for them. And how do you figure out where is the best strategic place for them to enter? Do you do baby steps and get used to it and, and figure out how to be a device company first? Or do you take the grand leap and say, we want, we want, we want the big one. We want all of it. And so we're going to go right to the digital therapeutics. We're going to continue to develop our drugs. But as we do that development, we're going to start looking for the digital therapeutic and develop that together. And maybe they won't come to market at the same time. Mm-hmm. But we will have a strategy that will make us the front runner because we've we've done it all. Jody, we've that, gotten squeezed that, every you know drop of blood out of it. We can. Jody, that's terrific, and 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 the reason is you you actually anticipated one of my questions that was going to come a little bit later, which is this fascinating idea of combination therapy. You know, and um, whether it's independently developed or whether you know from a from a label point of view you actually go to the agency and you actually produce data on combinations of this drug and digital therapeutic combination but Eddie you've actually done your uh, Achille actually did a, did an alliance um a, a co-development alliance right um the one you had entered into with Shinogi a while ago any 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 since since you've been on the front of that any any perspectives about working with pharma and and how that that kind of not only how how it turns out, I, I, what are the, what are the things you see that that kind of throw up a little bit? I don't want to say red flags, but say but indicate to you that you you, you know because it's fascinating, right? You you're coming from completely different worlds, right? And yet you're meeting in the middle for for patient need, um, sure. and and so I'd love to hear some of your thoughts on that. Sure. Yeah. One of the reasons we chose, so the deal we did with Shinogi, um, which is now in phase three clinical trials, which is exciting. We partnered before phase two um, and it's all the way through, com- the deal goes all the way through commercialization and, and commercial growth, which we're hoping comes at the next step. So um, this deal with Shinogi, which is for Japan and Taiwan rights of our product, um, the reason we did it was twofold. Uh, and I think this defines my threshold of what needs to happen in the industry. Um, first, they have a real commitment to this product in all the ways it can be used. And that's really important. So I think the if I think about red flags, you asked, a red flag for me is when a company wants to use something digital to sell a little bit more of their other product or uh, use a digital product to patient engagement for patient engagement goals. Um, but not really invest in it as a franchise, as a product. Um, the beauty of our Shianogi collaboration, I give them a lot of credit, is they said, we see what's happening in the mental health and specifically ADHD market. Um, we have, they are the um, uh, market leading company because they have the licenses to the market leading drugs um, in Japan. And they said, we need more. We need more actual therapeutic options. And uh, and so that was big. They have a sales force. They intend, if all goes well in clinical, to market this alongside and independently from medication. So they're treating it like a real product. And I think it's that mindset that is actually critical, right? Do they treat this like a real pharmaceutical asset? Um, and in this case, they did. The second thing is one of the um, <laughs> one of the uh, uh, tests, uh, if, if they're treating it like a real asset, is what did they pay for it? And the net present value of our deal with Shionogi is exactly what you'd expect for the net present value of a molecule, a new safe molecule in ADHD. So to me, that's the that's really the test and the threshold that shows at least one company is really thinking about this in a strong way. Um, I'm seeing more movement. As Jody mentioned, there's, you know, you have different people and groups looking to take either small bites or maybe some big bites and big swings. Um, I love what Pfizer recently did. Pfizer now has a unit called uh, DHM, Digital Health and Medicine, um, and a, an executive who actually was a digital therapeutic operating executive is now leading that, and it's an independent 
Um, it's an independent operating line, business line within Pfizer. So this is good. It's good momentum. Um, I think you'll see a bifurcation. I think what you'll see over the next few years is uh, pharmaceutical companies that still view these products as toys or add-ons or just you know fun accoutrements to what they do. Um, and then I think you'll see maybe the other half who really invest and say, this is actually part of the future of medicine and we want to have a big play and we want to drive scale. Um, my personal bias belief is that latter group has the right idea. Um, and hopefully that means you'll see more internal and more partner development approaches like what we've done. Great. So I'm a digital therapeutics developer um, and, and I'm thinking about, you know, the world now that we've defined digital therapeutics and i think we have no doubt about what we're talking about at least for the purposes of this dialogue um how many how many do i have to do i have to you know when we think about the pharmaceutical industry and we think about the evolution of the pharmaceutical industry there was a time many decades ago where pretty much this idea of therapeutic specialization didn't exist right every pharma company was in every therapeutic area and then they all rationalized and went through, even the largest ones said, you know what, we're going to be in three therapeutic areas or four therapeutic areas, and that's it. Um, to cross over to the other side for a minute into, into digital therapeutics and, and think about, um, and everybody can come at this question because, you know, Nadav, you can come at it from somebody coming to you with a, with a great new, you know, platform for digital therapeutics. And, you know, and you have to think about where, where it would be have its most therapeutic relevance where how much you could build on it you know so when we think about these these these, these i guess my question really relates to platforms right how broad are these platforms and how much can they cross therapeutic areas you know we see a lot in cns jody you gave a great summary before of all the different therapeutic areas that um that digital therapeutics can apply to eddie you've certainly started off with cns applications um, you know, some of the other companies that I read, read about that, that look like um, more or less like what you're doing, Eddie, you know, again, within, the, let's just call it within the more traditional development, um, you know, environment, um, most of it seems CNS focused. Um, so do we, do we have to focus within CNS? Um, you know, do you go from being an ADHD company, for instance, to being able to treat depression, being able to treat, you know, um, you know, movement disorders? Um, I'm just, I, I'm thinking a little more broadly about how we, how we, how we think about therapeutic area specialization in the context of digital therapeutics. I'll open that to the panel. I'll just give a quick answer and then let others expand on it. Um, I do think CNS is a logical starting point because, you know, when you're interacting with experiential software, the brain is kind of one of the, the um, well, the brain is both uh, one of the best areas to work. It's the most proximal thing to work on because you're getting, you know, information into the eyes and, and the motor uh, system of the, of the patient. And it's frankly the area of medicine that has lagged behind everything else, right? We don't do a very good job in treating brain conditions with traditional medicine. So I think that's why you've seen CNS start. But I do believe that the, the um, uh, mechanisms of action that you're seeing in the latest um, batch of digital therapeutics, they absolutely apply across disease and they go into motor, they go into balance, they go into ocular um, we have some folks that are trying to look at comorbidities outside of uh, areas like cancer, right? Broad oncology. So I do think that it's a really broad spectrum that we will see. Probably things that we, you know, no one 10 years ago envisioned a video game that could treat ADHD. That actually seemed anathema to the condition. And so I think we're going to see more and more things that really open people's minds that on this panel, we probably can't even quite envision today. Research is just moving so fast. Yeah. And, and I'll add on to that, you know, in the 25 years I've been doing medical device work, there have been a number of times that I've had technology, technology come across my desk where I've thought, that's not going to work. Um, and I think the really cool thing, and, and it does, that's what's amazing, right? And so the really cool thing about this is I think CNS applications, the, the, the delta in terms of how you have to convince people that they would work is smaller because it is a, it, 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 it's a little intuitive that that would some of these things may well work. I think some of these other applications, 
the convince it's going to take more convincing that they actually work, which is why that evidence, the clinical evidence, is going to be so important to be able to show people the data that demonstrates a clinical effect. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think it's really exciting because it, it really just opens up this whole new way of treating patients that was really not an option ten years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and and as we know, the the new molecules coming out, there there are not as many of them as there were 20 years ago, and right. so it's super exciting. Um, yeah, that's great. Voitech, thank you, Jody. Voitech, listening to what Jody's saying and listening to what what Eddie said, and in the dive, I know you can give a, a wide spectrum of the the all the innovation that you see that's going on. Let me put my pear hat on. Um, is this making me excited or is it making me nervous? Am I, uh, and why am I excited? What's exciting me? And, and let's be cold about the pears, you know? I mean, I'm, I'm concerned about my budget impact. I'm concerned about, you know, sure, maybe the first couple that get through, I say, sure, it's not gonna be, you know, it sounds good. This is, sounds very promising, let's go. But now we're gonna get a whole industry. And if we get a whole industry, does that start to make me nervous? Um, what do I think about my my you know my my P and T review and my you know how do we adapt those approaches? You know, um, one of the things that fascinates me, I want to know if PBMs are going to be operating in the world of digital therapeutics, right? What do you think, Voita? Oh, I think a lot. Uh, so that's a that's probably a twelve hour answer. But the, the the quick answer is so we've done here our, our organization a massive amount of research and. When I say massive, it's it's a longitudinal study over you know hundreds hundred sixty payers right now, right, uh, on a very very granular level to all of those assets. So let's take one by one and try to answer them quickly. So P and T committees, uh, there is much less variability than it was twelve months ago. Right, so twelve months ago, an average payer, if you ask, everybody had a different answer. Right now, they they within three percentage points of an answer. So. They're forming, they solidify, and they're finding answers. Uh, a lot of it, and without going into the details, is they finding that pilots are working because it is product dependent, right? So depending on what the product is and how the product operates, it has to be very different. And to an earlier point um, about the business models, it's also about, is your sales force able to support, right? So there's a level of integration uh, into the IT systems that you have to do with some of these products that plays a role. So that's another concern that you have to jump over. There is essentially a lot of the, every payer type has a different approach also, right? So if I'm a regional payer, am I looking at a large population? Not really, so I'm solving different problems. However, and I'll say this, generally when we looked at the urgency of you know, which therapeutic areas you want to cover, how quickly do you want to cover? There seems to be a trend that some therapeutic areas, so cardio, metabolic, um, payers sort of settle down. They have a way of evaluating them. They know what they're looking for. They know how to solve them. And they slowly progressing into the others. They've dipped their toes in oncology and they've dipped their toes in other areas where they just said they're already dropping products, right? So that alone... Uh, shows you that the market is verifying uh, what's working, what's not working. And to Eddie's point, CNS, it is one of those where it's broad enough, it's safe enough, and there's there's been enough tailwind to sort of help the situation, right? I think with the COVID telehealth, uh, also a lot of the government programs around opioid abuse, uh, you know, mental health and therapy, this, it, it's been a good, good proving ground. And I think that's what's helping the payers. But in the end, and I'm gonna wrap up with this, it's all about engagement, right? Are so, patients using this? So, so Vortec, do, do I need to have a, a, a digital therapeutics, a separate formulary for digital therapeutics if I'm a payer? Or, or do, I, do I put them right through the current formulary you know, management process? Do I, do I drive them? Do I drive the manufacturers to pay rebates? Um, do, I, do I go to Eddie's, Eddie and his sales team and say, sure, you can get onto tier two here, but you're going to have to pay a, a very, do they, do they fall outside this right now? Or are they going to come back? Are they going to come in or how's that all going to work? 
So it's a it, 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 it's an interesting question, right? Because again, I want to say product dependent. If I was a payer talking to Eddie, my answer would be let's make this simple, right? And I think it will create a win-win for everyone. It works like a it, it works like a prescription drug. It doesn't require any specific, you know, any crazy integration. It doesn't. So let's just put it on the pharmacy benefit and move on. If it's a diagnostic that's part of a larger medical, you know, medical disease, that's probably a medical review. Creating digital formularies, um, it, this is just my personal opinion. I don't think they're necessary, right? You can simply say it's either a part of a medical treatment or it's a prescription that treats a disease, right? So the whole overcomplication, it's, it seems to be somewhat unnecessary. And I think we're going to see a lot of... <laughs> Thank you, Eddie. I think we're going to see a lot of resolution around this because it, when the, the, the biggest problem was that 12 months ago when we did the survey, the, very few of the payers actually admitted to understanding the FDA regulation and understanding the di differentiation between um, software as medical devices or, or digital therapeutics. Yeah. Right now, that differentiation is definitely there. They understand how FDA approves these products. And they have pilot, you know, pilot programs in place, actually pilot to coverage programs where you can tap into and say, you know, let's try it together, let's work it out how this will work. Yeah, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna Ed, actually, I want, I Ed, want to be hold a little on. bit. I want Ed, to be a little. I hate, I hate to jump in here. Yeah. Uh, the time has just zoomed right past. We've got just a whole boatload of great we, questions. We do. So, we and, do. And I, so I, I think we need to get get to them but just want the panel in a few seconds to address the myth that it take that in terms of time money and risk it's just a fraction of what it takes to develop a conventional drug yeah when it comes to a digital therapeutic and and maybe quickly jody and eddie could could address that uh, point should i start generally eddie and then Great maybe question. say, say yeah. a couple of things more specifically so oh, okay. you know I, I think the beautiful thing about medical devices is much why I like it in this space is because the products are, are the result of targeted engineering, right? So you don't have like in the pharmaceutical space sort of this eureka moment where you find a molecule that has therapeutic effect and then you figure out how to, how to, how to make that work. Um, whereas in, in med the medical device space, we have a target and we engineer to that target. And so that means you have the ability to develop faster and a methodical development. And so, but that process for the development take, does take years, maybe not 20 years, but it does definitely take years. Um, I would say it, and, and they are at the same time developing the data. It's a different type of data that they're developing. You know, they're running veg studies, animal studies, um, user studies, different type of data than you are in the pharmaceutical space, but they are making the investment in that data. So, so, and they are running clinical studies, which are hugely expensive and, and large clinical studies, maybe not thousands of patients, but actually large controlled clinical studies. So it is perhaps shorter and perhaps somewhat less expensive, but I wouldn't say that it's quick and dirty by any stretch of the imagination. I Eddie, agree. do you want to add? I don't have much to add. I think you're right. It can be quicker. It's much more efficient. The cool thing as a company is you get to explore maybe a few different angles where with, you know, a pharmaceutical, you have to go all in on, on one disease area and do this long stepwise process. So it still takes work. It took us, you know, less than a pharmaceutical, but it still took us five years of an ADHD program and, and tens of millions of dollars to get to a point where you have a validated therapeutic. So um, I agree with everything Jody said. It is, it's cheaper and less, but it's not like any random company can spin up with a few bucks and do it. Great. Okay. All right. Well, Thomas uh, and Ed, why don't you you go yeah, to the floor for questions? Yeah. So, so I just sent a note over to Thomas. So, um, and we do have a ton of questions. Um, some of them are directed at specific panelists, and some are more broad. So, Thomas, I know you've been actively monitoring them. Do you want to? Do you want to? Do you want to lead a, sure. a just Happy to, throw out some of those questions? I mean, it's been a very robust discussion, and there have been uh, commentary back and forth by folks as well. So, I've kind of. Uh, captured uh, open questions. Shmuel asked uh, early on, uh, what are uh, the, uh, how to improve accessibility for the poor and the low socioeconomic groups and health equity and access obviously is a critical part of current, the current dis 
discussion about healthcare. Uh, how does DTX fit into that? I can, I can certainly help with that one. We've done extensive analysis of healthcare shortage provided areas in uh, in in US, and the low and short is that people with that. So you can have. The, the, you know, there'll never be enough doctors and there'll never be enough doctors of a certain um, you know, cultural background that will self, serve every patient, right? And I think that's where digital therapeutics stands out above and beyond any pill because in order for any pill or tablet to work, you have to go to the doctor, you have to have conversation, right? And a lot of people are simply unable to get there or just get the help. There's been a numerous studies showing that diversity plays a uh, plays a huge role in medicine. So, for example, Walmart had a number of clinics opened up for their own employees, hired a bunch of doctors, threw a lot of money on the problem. It turns out that people wanted to see doctors that look like them, talk like them, and have cultural experiences just like them. Right? That's not something that's going to be resolved by either money or tablets, and that's where digital therapeutics can really help equalize the field. Maybe yeah, I'll, think... I'll, I'll, I'll jump in for a sec. Um, I think, first of all, I agree with, with Wojtek. I would just add that I think it's a question of pricing, um, you know, how to expand that product to be relevant to more people. Um, and also in terms of, you know, what is the relevant tech to facilitate that? If you think about couple, if you if if you, we can kind of like have in mind a couple of numbers maybe the most important one is that 25% of americans don't have access to broadband uh, access internet and and or smartphones many of the digital therapeutic products we currently see in the market relies on 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 these two and these 25% are actually maybe the most interesting patients or consumers you can you can reach because they generally live um, with a greater distance from um, sufficient level of care or, or to uh, large hospitals. So how can you make this population or how can you enable more access for this population? I think that's, that's a very interesting question to ask. Um, how can you make products more versatile and, and having, you know, Unit economics to make sense to support these patients. Um, maybe that is something worth having in mind. I'll, I'll, I'll have to jump in here because I am passionate about this specific topic, and I'll say, and I've seen this these numbers thrown a lot, a lot, uh, a lot. So currently, ninety eight percent of people have access to internet. Do you need broadband to participate in therapy? Uh, very rarely. That's I think that's number one. And number two, if I'm sitting in a, and I'll give an example here, in the middle of Montana, it will still be a, easier for me to get to a public library, use a computer with, and participate in a therapy, you know, easier and without stigmas, it will still be easier than finding a healthcare provider within a two, you know, two hour radius where I have to use a car, spend money on gas, take time off of work and so on and so on. So I think that's not a, a, yes, these numbers are thrown a lot about the usage of broadband, but I think there's the, the, the underlying analysis of how they're done. So a lot of states are, as part of Medicaid, are providing smartphones, right? Which are not included in that calculation. So that solves another problem and so on and so on. And this is a, a really long conversation, but I think generally speaking, access, with digital therapeutics would be exponentially higher than what it is right now for an average therapy. Yeah, that's, that, that's the promise, yeah. So short answer to uh, this question is that digital therapeutics is part of the answer. Can we improve accessibility within digital therapeutics? Undoubtedly, but compared to the alternative, it's a, it's a huge, it has a huge promise. Bon asks, uh, well, how does the FDA regulatory pathway compare to Germany or other countries for digital therapeutics? It, so very, very different um, in Germany. So the DIGA program in Germany actually flips a lot of this on its head, right? So it's... Um, it's allowing, you do have to have clinical evidence, but um, it's essentially allowing marketing and even um, whatever price point you initially select to be paid for. 
by the government before even having a um, you know super in depth review of is this is this actually working in patients. I think it's actually a great idea. I mean, all these companies do have to have um, you know do have to have clinical data that they've demonstrated is is safe and effective. Um, but so it's really innovating. It's a little bit less innovating on the regulatory side and a little bit more on that bridge between regulatory and patient access. Um, so I think it's really strong. Um, what I will say is the FDA process um, has been uh, more rigorous in terms of, especially through the de novos, we mentioned um, that distinction earlier. So de novo processes at the FDA have kind of had the highest bar compared to other territories. Um, each territory does its own um, does its own thing. The one thing I can mention is uh, in Asia, because a lot of people don't know what's happening in Asia right now, that is mirroring the FDA a lot. So PMDA in Japan, CFDA in China um, is mirroring uh, very much the FDA process. So I think what you'll have is the US and Asian countries, not all, but many of the large kind of medical markets for Asian countries will be um, reviewing things similarly. And then you'll have Europe, which has a little bit of a different review system. Terrific. Uh, Zoe asks, uh, what can we learn from the experience of PEAR? Um, do you have uh, and that are therapeutics that are laying off people? Obviously, these are general currents, but what can uh, uh, what does our panel say about that? I feel like I should take this one too. It would be weird for me not to. So Achille and Pear were kind of the two early horses in this industry that now has many, many companies. Um, and what we've seen with paratherapeutics recently, saying they're looking for strategic options, um, you know, acquisitions or otherwise on their assets. Um, I think it's really, this is a more macroeconomic factor. Yes, it has to do with the, you know, the uptake in insurance isn't as fast as they had wanted, um, but the product is getting uptake. The product is doing substantial revenues um, or their products. And I think what you're seeing, and this is what I meant earlier about this industry is gonna have to get more creative because companies, even the leading companies in this industry are nascent, we're not pharmaceutical companies, we're very susceptible to macroeconomic factors. Mm -hmm. And what's happening right now is if you don't have enough capital to last through what most people think is going to be a long recession, um, then financing options, even as a public company, which pair is, is very, very difficult. So um, Pair kind of hit, you know, in my view, they've done a great job, um, uh, you know, bringing their products out. But what's different is uh, they haven't yet figured out the scalable model, right? What, what they're seeing is they're able to get these big state contracts. They're able to get big bulk purchase contracts at the state level uh, here in the U.S. Um, but what investors are looking for is two things, which is a scalable, repeatable year over year growth model. Um, and they're looking for companies to establish that when they have, you know, more than six months of capital. And I think, unfortunately, the position that paratherapeutics is in the learning is um, the model kind of the year over year um, uh, growth model or confidence in that growth model that can trend toward profitability was not established uh, quick enough, even though revenues grew, that model wasn't established quick enough. And when you have less than six months of capital, it's a really tough position to be in in this economic climate. Yeah, Eddie, I just want to, I want to throw in that that that's one of the, and to everybody, that's one of the reasons I asked re very early on in the conversation about the business models, right? I mean, and about how we need to think deeply about the business models. And I'm sure, Nadav, when you are looking at financing a company or investing in a company, um, that's got to be, you know, kind of front and center to you, you know, so the business model question is, is probably not going to go away. It's, 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 I think the issue is it is going to be a fair amount of learning from experience, right? We're going to see, yeah. and, you know, and there, there's going to be inevitably with any field, there's some, there's some learning in the job. Let me go back to you, Thomas, and, and questions you have, um, you have left over. Sure. Julia asks, uh, can the panelists discuss the impact of the 2022 FDA guidance on enhancing diversity of clinical trials in the normal practices of child design and digital therapeutics. Anyone want to take that? I'll, I'll try to answer very quickly. So um, the reason I think digital therapeutics have a potential to make a big impact here, even in clinical trials from a diversity of recruitment perspective, 
is that they don't suffer what has happened in the pharmaceutical world, which is aversion to medication, which tends to be skewed and disparate depending on the socioeconomic and racial group that you're talking to. So um, it's well documented across mental health that different mental health conditions have really dramatically different approachability to medicine care, meaning pill-based medicine. We don't, I can speak from personal experience, we don't see that in our digital therapeutic trials. We see extremely fast recruitment and we see a broad base of recruitment across um, typical demographic or demographics that typically are more averse to pharmaceutical. So I do think there's a, um, that's one angle that could potentially have a huge impact in clinical trials. And I think I'll just add that the linkage between kind of access to these technologies is, is a little bit easier than with, you know, drugs and traditional medical devices. And, and that will help. I mean, diversity in clinical trials, generally speaking, has not been great. Um, just because generally those populations tend to be a, a more affluent, middle-class, predominantly white population who have, who have access to the, these clinical trials. And, and hopefully, um, just by the nature of the technology, we will get a better cross-section of actually what the U.S. looks like within those studies, which will actually make those studies and the data more robust. Maybe, so, maybe, maybe one additional observation. I do think that a couple of digital therapeutic companies have in a way uh, segmented themselves or pivoted into more like being patient engagement plays. You look at uh, Happyfy and, I, and Outwell and, and Sidekick and, and you know, patient engagement is a huge issue, of course, but perhaps with these you know, gamification of engagement, you will have more uh, people who are alluded to that approach and perhaps a more diverse group, you know, participating. So that's very interesting, you know, to watch. So DTX is also part of the solution uh, in recruitment, uh, or could be. Uh, Peter asks, can the panelists comment on the general patent strategy for DTX? I don't think we have a patent attorney on the. <laughs> maybe maybe I'll, I'll I'll take that because we, we try to examine that you know in terms of our, our diligence process. I think overall with software you know patents are much more challenging as opposed to medical devices. There is always the question of do you want to expose your secret sauce and how you know and and is it really uh, something you can protect going forward. Um, I think there is no silver bullet here. Uh, in some cases, there would be opportunities to patent certain things, but you will always need to balance that with the risk of, you know, exposing your code and, and kind of like a uh, special approach. I'm very curious to hear, you know, Eddie's thoughts on that, but that's at least, you know, the way we think about that. Yeah, we've, we've actually been able to use patents to good use here. You do have to expose a little bit of, of what you do, but the good news is with the changes about four or five years ago to the algorithm patent process, you don't have to expose every little bit of math equation, which is helpful. So uh, we have granted patents that are foundational patents for our technology. We've been able to use that uh, proactively, you know, offensively and defensively actually, um, in the market, which is great. Um, and I think the beauty of uh, digital treatment is you can also tap into alternative, um, or the supplemental, um, IP like trademarks, copyrights, design patents. So we do, we actually do all of the above. Um, and it, it seems to be a, a good kind of total protective package. That's great. Okay, uh, Bon asks uh, about the topic of patient reported outcomes or um, he's attended a conference recently. Do we see stakeholders adopting it as performance metrics? Uh, are there any specific issues? The FDA is nuts about patient reported outcomes, but they can be confounded by a geriatric po uh, population and what sort of questions they'll answer and so forth. Any spe specific topics or observations in DTX? I think DTX is an area where FDA is really interested in real world outcomes and patient reported outcomes. I think the, the beauty of it is when you're talking about digital applications is you can actually use the application to gather that data and not wholly rely on, you know, automatically gather that the data you need, but, and not wholly rely on your patients picking up, logging things, providing information and, and the applications can make it easier for them. Um, but I think one of the other beautiful things about digital therapeutics is just 
the amount of data you have from a manufacturer's perspective that you can use to really understand how well your applications are being used out there and, and, how, and use it to innovate. Um, whereas, you know, traditional products, you actually have to go out and seek that information. Whereas I think if you, if you design them right, you actually have all of that data served right up for you. If I could just comment, sorry, go ahead. I actually think this is an interesting area, the whole area of gathering data, because pharma has been gathering data for a very, very long time and have, have been able to process very little. Payers are interested in data, but they have very limited resources to process and gain understanding out of the data. So there's a lot of uh, talk about gathering the data and obviously digital therapeutics is the perfect vehicle. In some cases, you got this data that the social determinants of health that you would never ever be able to find out through even chart reviews or anything else. The question becomes, will the companies, the DPX companies really be able to serve that data to their stakeholders, to, to payers, to you know, hospitals and to FDA and so on and so on? Because processing this amount of data spends enough time in software to know how difficult it is. So I think we're asking, you know, most people right now are just asking the wrong question. It's how do we get on the data? It's not can we collect the data and can we use it? You know, actually, I have confidence they're software companies. But, but Jody, you are making a point that's quite relevant to uh, a distinction of DTX to molecular pharmacology approaches, let's say, which is the, um, the, the patient feedback is very amenable to rapidly improving the product. And of course, uh, the FDA is usually uh, more used to the model of a next version coming back to them to start from zero, if you will, for the review process. And the FDA, I think the FDA just uh, within the last, this week uh, set out its guidelines for predetermined change controls. Any comment on the character and uh, the degree to which DTX could uh, help, uh, could exploit the features, the peculiar aspects of DTX to improve care in a way that maybe pharmacology hasn't or can't? Yeah, you know, I, I do think that the nature of devices is that they iterate pretty quickly. I mean, I, I think the number that used to be thrown around just for traditional devices is 18 months. You're coming out with a new version. You know, when you talk about software company, the software is a medical device and then also digital therapeutics, you know, they iterate very quickly, they, they, because most of these are going through as de novos, they do have some ability to tweak products without having to go back to the agency. Um, you know, you, you can't make major changes, but you can make tweaks to them. And so that does give them the ability to iterate to some extent, you know, these de novo products as they go back for those iterations for many of them, they are going back with the new 510K. They're not going back with a new a PMA or a de, new de novo. Um, it's not nothing, but it does it does have an easier path for sort of the the changes and modifications, you know, within some limitations. Um, but I think just the access to all of that data and to have it served up and available to you as a manufacturer really just sort of opens the door to be able to make the products better, get better efficacy, make it more user-friendly, create a better patient experience. Thomas, I, I think we're, we're almost up against the, um, the hour. Um, so what I, if it's okay, what, I, what I'd like to do is, um, is just all the questions are collected on the chat. There are the many, many more that we could get to, which is terrific. Not terrific if you've asked a question and we haven't gotten to it, but terrific indicator of the interest and the engagement of this audience. So, so thank you to all, you know, very, very much. Um, we don't really have enough time to go through a, a wrap up. Um, what I did want to say about the, the for everybody panelists to wrap up, but I wanted to say about the, the questions themselves, if they're directed to a specific panelist or maybe to the broader panel, uh, perhaps the Connexum team can get them, um, you know, sure. distributed um, over to the over to the panelists. So, so I just want to, um, in closing, just say um, thank you, thank you, thank you, you know, to everybody, to the Connexum team for pulling together this fascinating um, discussion. Um, we are, I think, um, really, really 
Um, I don't want to be, you know, pompous and say breaking new ground, but but for me, this is breaking new ground. You know, as again, I'll finish where I started. I'm a, you know, a multi-decades long strategist um, in pharma and biotech. Um, and it would be very easy for me to dismiss digital therapeutics. And actually, I initially did want to dismiss digital therapeutics, um, but I've learned a ton. Um, I the, the panelists' engagement was just terrific. Um, so I want to I want to just thank everybody, you know, for representing such a diversity of perspectives, doing it so well, and moving forward. What is at the end of the day the most important thing? A field that's going to bring benefits to patients. So. With that, I'll give it back to Zan, and we'll close out. Oh, well said, Ed, and likewise, terrific, wonderful contributions from all our panelists. I, I know I speak for everybody who tuned in and those who will be watching later that this was just a wonderful uh, event, and we look forward to uh, engaging with you as we provide our post-meeting minutes and our uh, notes and answers to these questions. So again, Ed and panel, thank you so much. Hope everybody has a great weekend.